<clears throat> amen and amen. How are we doing, church? Good. Aren't you glad you came to church? Hey, grab your Bible. Mark chapter 2 is where we're going to be. We're in week 3 of this series called Anything is Possible. And I'm going to ask you a question as you're turning to Mark 2. I'll be there in just a second. Have you ever found yourself in a desperate situation? Some of you walked in here that way tonight. Sometimes it's worse when the people that you love the most find themselves in a desperate situation, right? And the question is, what would you do if somebody that you love dearly found themselves in an impossible situation, like one of your parents get diagnosed with something that scares everybody? Or maybe it's your spouse and he or she is stuck in a situation and they can't get themselves out of it. Or maybe it's your kid. There's no pain like kid pain, right? And what would you do? What would you do if it was your child or your best friend, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, and you had one chance, one chance to make a difference in their life? The real question is, what wouldn't you do? You see, that's the kind of attitude you've got to bring to Mark 2. You see, because part of the problem is, the moment I said Mark 2, some of you like old school people that grew up in Sunday school, praise God for that, but you already know the end of the story before we ever start, and you can't think like Veggie Tales or Final Graph, depending on your age, okay? You've got to see the desperation in these friends' lives before they ever get there. Have you ever been in a desperate situation? About 15, 16 years ago, something like, well, not quite that long ago, about, I don't know, 13 years ago, I'm in Dick's Sporting Goods. Imagine this. This was back when they sold guns. Hadn't been there much lately, but back when they sold guns, they used to go a lot, okay? And JP was with me, and so he was about this tall. So however old that is, I'm not good with ages, okay? He was about this tall. And I was standing at the counter in the, um, <clears throat> in the rifle section. I think I was looking at a scope, like every good Christian ought to be. And so I'm talking to the guy, and I look back at JP, and he had scooted off a minute. And I'm like, whoa, 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 come here, dude. Come here, come here. You stay right here on that spot. You do not move. Do you understand? Do not pass go right there. No problem, daddy. And I look back, look back at him again. Boom, he'd move. I said, boy, I don't think you understand, Okay. You give up here, if your ears are clogged up, I can warm up that backside, it'll melt the wax, and you'll be able to hear better, you understand? And I know some of you are like, ah! It's a whole different sermon series, but you got issues. Anywho, we're there. <clears throat> and so I talk to the guy, and I look at the scope, and when I turn around the next time, that dude is gone. And the inner Perry Martin Jr., that's my daddy's name, came out of me, and I was like, you let me find this, oh my gosh, all right? And so I look around, and I look around, and I look around, and I don't see him anywhere, all right? And so then I move from the hunting section to the fishing section, because I'm a Martin, if we're not hunting, we're fishing, that's what we do, and so now I'm, I'm going aisle by aisle, looking, hey, JP, JP, where you at, boy, JP? Hey, you better come to me, you know, I'm looking, looking, and then it begins to switch from when I find that boy to, oh my gosh, I hope I find this boy, you know? I mean, I got the little, like, the little, the kind of mom panic, moms, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> now, y'all go there like, where is he? you be like, honey, we're at home, he just went to the bathroom, but you know what I'm talking about. That's what makes you a great mom, by the way, okay? It just is. There's just lights and shadows. Anywho, then I, began to, then I began to look through. I don't know what people created the kind of racks of clothes that go all the way around. People that hate kids or parents, really, you know? Because my kid, we read, we read C.S. Lewis, Chronicles of Narnia at my house, and so I think he thought he was like going to Narnia through every one of those little areas. And I'm looking, I don't see feet, and he's, he's shorter than the rack is, so I don't see his little blonde hair. He looked like Ric Flair when he was born, all right? <clears throat> Now, about a year and a half before that event, we used to live at the beach, and the Jacksonville Beach Police Department came to me and said, how would you like to be the, the chaplain for Jack's Beach PD? And I thought, yeah, well, okay, what do I do? <clears throat> and they said, well, you're, you're just kind of, you're kind of like a pastor to the police officers. If they need something, if they have, if they need help, they need prayer, if they got marriage stuff going on, you're just like a friend and a pastor to the police department. And <clears throat> if, if there's bad news to people, citizens, then you tell the bad news. I was like, yeah, I could do that. I'd be happy to serve. But what they didn't tell me at first, which was super cool, is I got a uniform, like a full-on police uniform, all right? And even better than that, because you can't just wear that everywhere, you know, I got a badge, a badge, like a badge. It said, had my number, you know, you got a little police number on it. It said chaplain on it, but then I got a little wallet. They give you this wallet, and you could pull that wallet out and be like, Phew, it showed a badge. <laughs> Look like Starsky and Hutch. Y'all don't know, they were traveling evangelists back in the 1970s, okay? <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so now I'm back in Dick's Sporting Goods, and I'm looking around, and I can't find, and my mind is going to all kind of awful places. 
I think somebody has scooped up this good-looking little boy, and they have, they're selling him on the internet or something. You know what I mean? Somebody's got him in a duffel bag, and they're toting him to the van as we speak. And I am freaking out. I mean, desperate. What am I going to do? And then I thought, hmm, I have an idea. So I went to the manager, and I said, Jack's Beach PD, we've got a lost child in this store. Shut her down. <laughs> Straight up, man. Now, I don't know if you know this. Do you know they have, like, protocol for that? This dude gets on the phone. He's like, we got a code red, code red, and boo, Dick's Sporting Goods shuts down. The elevators quit. The escalators quit. The associates stand at the door, and people are stacked up, won't let people in or out. And I am looking around. I was on the second floor, if you've ever been to the one at the town center, looking to who I was going to, like, rappel down on and, like, arrest. I don't think a chaplain can arrest people, but they didn't know that. <laughs> then I walk around, and J.P., is standing there amazed and wondering where the stairs on the escalator disappear to. <laughs> and then when I got him, I was like, yes, uh-oh. And so I took him by the hand, I walked by the manager again, I was like, crisis averted, carry on. <laughs> well done on your code red, I'll include you in my report. And then we went home, all right, now. <laughs> Later, when I short shared a version of that story with Gretchen, she was like, is that legal? I don't know. <laughs> and I don't care. Because if it takes me going to prison to save my little boy, wouldn't you? Every single one of us would do that, right? Right. There's a man in Capernaum, and he's paralyzed. And he's been there for a long time. And one day, his friends, he's got at least four friends, and his friends hear that somebody is shown up to town, and the rumor has it that this brother does miracles, that he makes the lame walk and the blind see, and little, dir little girls come back from the dead, and he can walk on water, that this man does miracles. And then they begin to think, in a desperate situation, what can we do for you? I don't know, but here's what we'll try. We're going to pick you up, and we can just get you into the presence of this miracle worker. Maybe, just maybe, he can change everything. You see, that's what's going on when you get to Mark chapter 2. It starts out this way in verse 1. And when he, that's Jesus, returned to Capernaum after some days, and what he was doing is he was doing miracles according to chapter 1. It was reported that he was at home. It was actually Peter's house probably where he was staying. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. So his ministry is blowing up, you understand? Everybody there is there to see him. It's like Taylor Swift at a Girl Scout convention, you know? They're like, ah, everybody wants to get a piece of this. But look what he was doing. And he was preaching the word to them. Now, please don't miss this in our series on miracles. The point of miracles are not the miracles themselves. The point of miracles are to point people to the miracle maker. You see, what Jesus is doing every time he does a miracle is that the miracle is all about pointing people to the message. And so they came, these are the friends, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Verse four. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd. Stop right there for just a second. As the lead pastor of this thing, this is something that keeps us up at night. I, I need you to know this. As a staff, as elders, as deacons, as pastors and ministers of this church, this is one thing we want to always avoid. We, we always want to make sure that there's room for your one more. You see, the point of our ministry is not full rooms. It's not big buildings. That's not what it is. We've never even tried to be a big church. All we've ever tried to do is just reach one more person. And a part of the reason that, that we have multiple campuses and a part of the reason that you're sitting in this expanded place is there was a few years there where our rooms are full to the point where people would show up and there were no more spots to check your kids in and and people would hear the news, I'm sorry, but we're full. I mean, listen, that can't happen on our watch 1122. I mean, I know the story of a mom. Now they're covenant members of 1122, but she's married, is 
they're having a little rocky time, and she wakes up one day and thinks, you know what I'll try? I'll try church. That's what she thinks. She gets all her kids ready. Hey, honey, you want to come? She, he's like, nah, I don't think I want to, which is part of the problem back then. And then so she gets all her kids ready, and even though it's called 1122, you know, she gets there about 1130, walks up to the door, and, and we have no room in the inn is a cute line for a Christmas play. It ain't cool for a Sunday morning where this desperate mom is just trying to show up and see what Jesus can do for her, right? That's what's happening right here. And they could not get near him because of the crowd. But look what the four friends do. They removed the roof above him, and when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. Now, before we get into the details of this, let me ask you a question. I'm going to spend the majority of my time asking you, are you one of those kinds of friends, okay? But before we get there, let me ask you this. Do you have four friends like this? Because if things, even if things are going really awesome in your life, there is going to come a day in your life where you are paralyzed. It literally, it could be physically, but it might be financially, it might be spiritually, it might be relationally, it might be emotionally. There is going to come a time in your life where you need some friends around you to pick you up and carry you to Jesus. Do you have friends like this? Do you have four friends like this? Now, most of you are like, of course I do. Okay, write them down. I mean, really, write them down. I don't see you moving. I don't understand what we're doing here. Four names. Because if you can't write, if, if you've been following after Jesus for a minute and you can't write down the names of four friends down that would do anything at any time to take you to Jesus, then you're not doing this thing right. And let me tell you, married people, we're the worst at this. Married men, the absolute worst. You know why? Because we just settle for buddies. You're like, oh yeah, man, I got, you know, I got a golfing buddy and a poker buddy and a guy at work. I don't really like him, but we talk to him sometimes. And you settle for buddies. And buddies are fine, man. Buddies might be the way you get to a band of brothers, but what you need is a band of brothers. I mean, when's the last time you confessed a sin to somebody in your life and in their presence said, I, I'm going to repent of that sin? Done that lately? You ever done the thing where you ask somebody to pray for you and actually tell the truth about what you need? I don't mean this little weak sauce like Sunday school, I have an unspoken. What is that? Just shut up with the unspokens, okay? No, nah, man, my Bible says that we are to confess our sins to one another and pray for one another that we might be healed. You got somebody like that? If you don't have some kind of, some kind of spiritually significant conversation with a brother in arms, then, then you ain't doing it right. You gotta have the kind of men in your life that have refrigerator rights. You know what refrigerator rights are? These are people that don't knock on the door. They just roll in like Kramer. I know y'all don't know Kramer either, okay? They were like, also evangelists, all right? I mean, I got people in my life, they, you cannot be inappropriately dressed in my living room because you don't know who just walks in the door. How y'all doing, okay? They just come on in, go straight to the refrigerator. They know where the coffee is. They know where everything is. They just help themselves. And the thing is, the refrigerator is just an illustration to my actual life. You got friends like that? Do you have friends that know what they ought to be praying for in your life? Do they know your struggles, they know your temptations, they know what bait the enemy throws at you all the time? Listen, man, I don't even know if I'll say this on Sunday. I got an elder, I don't want to tell you his name, but his initials are Lars Peterson, and he'll say to me, <laughs> he's like, have you been looking at porno? And I'm like, porno? I don't even own a VCR, it's just called porn now, okay? It's, don't say porno, it sounds weird. But he loves me enough, and he knows primarily two things take out people in my position, monies and honeys. And so he asks all these questions, and digs all down in my soul. Why? Because he's one of my brothers that's willing to pick up a corner of the mat when I need it and tote me to Jesus. That's what you need too. <clears throat> Do you have people in your life that are more concerned about you than what you think about them? You know what prayer God loves to answer? God, would you give me some godly friends? And then you just gotta pay attention now. You just gotta pay attention. And then the next question would be, so are you a friend like this? Are you willing to be this kind of friend to somebody else? Are you the kind of person that is just entertained by other people 
If that's the case, man, you know you're just using them for your own benefit. That's not what God called us to do. God did not call us to tolerate one another. By the way, tolerance is not a biblical value. I got a possum that lives behind my house. As long as he don't get near my bird feeders, I tolerate him. I will allow him to live there. That is not how we are to treat one another. We are supposed to love one another. Are you the kind of person that loves the people in your life enough to say, here, I need to pick up your mat and at great expense to me, tote you to Jesus? And then we as a church, we must be willing to do whatever it takes to reach one more person, whatever it takes. Because I want you to think about this. The, the people that got their own time, the people that got there first, that got a front row seat, they were super comfy, right? And when the Bible says that they were digging through the roof, they didn't just pull back a couple of shingles. That the, the, the way they made a roof, you could kind of see it in the video, man. It was, it was a series of logs and sticks, and then they would bake the clay to make like a series of bricks that they called tiles, and then they would lay vegetation over it. I mean, it would be, it would be as thick as two feet. And so, if you don't like being disturbed during church, you would have hated Jesus' Bible study in this house. It's not like they just opened up the hatch and all of a sudden they're like, who is this? No, 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 man that there was a disturbance and this stuff started to fall. And guess who the stuff fell on? It fell on the people that already had a seat. Did I tell you, man, church folks can get comfortable real quick, right? Yeah, but these people did not mind disrupting what was going on there for the sake of their friend that needed Jesus. Listen, man, the point of church is not for us to be comfortable, is it? No, oh, man. In fact, man, this church ain't for you. This church ain't for me. This church is for him. And you know what he's into? People that don't know him yet coming to know him. And people that do know him growing deeper and deeper in relationship with him. That's what he's into. So may we never, ever, ever get comfortable with just full rooms. Because so many times, so many times, the, the longer you're at church, the more likely you are to just get comfortable with like us four and our uh, no more, have this little holy huddle, and when people not like you show up, you're like, eh, get out of here. The moment you do this, you are not walking in the footsteps of Jesus. Another thing, man, I don't know if you've replaced your roof lately. Tearing off roofs are expensive, amen? Yeah, it's what we literally did in this place. We tore off the roof so that more people could come to know Jesus. It's very expensive. But listen, we're not a savings and loan. That's not what we're here for, man. We're here to do whatever it takes to lead people to Jesus. And so every time you bring your first and best and you give generously, a part of what you're doing is you're helping this be the kind of place that does what it takes for people to meet Jesus. And so we're tearing off some more roofs. Um, this fall, fall of 2023, this fall, we're gonna open our next campus in North Jacksonville, amen? Praise God, praise God. <clears throat> and if you're interested in that and wanna go to the interest nights and all that kind of stuff, you could text the word North Jax to 441122. And somebody within 48 hours will follow up with you and give you all the information. Because one of the things that you could do is if you are driving by one of our campuses to get to a campus, then you should really consider going to the campus that, or, that it's right there. In addition to this, by Easter of 2024, we're gonna put a mobile site in St. Augustine. So St. Augustine, here we come. <clears throat> and in addition to that, by August of 2024, we're gonna put a mobile site in Yulee. We're going south and we're going north, all right? And those mobile sites will be permanent one day. That's just what we're gonna do. And in addition to that, for the people that are mobile in St. John's right now, then we're working on the permanent site, which is just right across the street from Creekside. And rumor is the trees, some of the trees are gonna start going down next week, right? Praise God. Now, <clears throat> let me tell you who loves a growing church. Here's who loves the kind of church that that's willing to spare no expense to, to be a partner with God in the Great Commission. The people that love a growing church is this, is the people that have a one more. The people that have a prodigal son or daughter and they're just praying God might partner with their church to reach their one more. The, 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 kind, of, the kind of people that, that, that have a spouse that doesn't know Jesus yet but you haven't given up on them. Why? Because if the tomb is empty, anything is possible. And you know that 
that we exist for all people to discover and deepen a relationship with Jesus Christ. But we're, we're also, we're not just tearing off roofs around here, man. We're doing it all over the world. I don't know if you realize this, but you, the Church of 1122, has planted five, this is as of yesterday, 516 churches around the world. <laughs> that every single weekend, there are more people around the world that, that attend the churches that we've planted than attend all of our campuses. Isn't that incredible? Because we've never been the point, man. The point is Jesus. And so we're gonna continuously tear through barriers to just get more people to Jesus. So that's what happens. They show up, hey, can't come in. They'll be like, okay. So they go up on the roof. They're creative, they're innovative. They do what it takes. They tear a hole in the roof. And then look at the response of Jesus. He doesn't say, shh, what are you doing? No. And when Jesus saw their faith, I mean, think about this. When Jesus saw their faith, when he sees the faith of the friends, he's gonna forgive this man's sin. Do you have so much faith that your friend can borrow some for a minute? Can you imagine, like can Jesus see your faith? You see, because faith, faith is not a feeling. Faith is when you put your trust, trust not in your circumstances, and the circumstances were rooms too full, roofs too hard to break through but they put their faith in their sovereign savior and Jesus could see it. You see, some people make excuses, some people make a difference. Nobody makes both. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. He looks at the paralytic. He says, son, this man been called all kind of names, man. According to John chapter nine, in the first century, people believed that if you had some kind of physical ailment, it was punitive from God. So the disciples were walking up on a blind man in John chapter nine, and they asked, Jesus, who has sinned? Was it this man's sin or his, or his father's sin that he was born blind? And Jesus is gonna say, no, 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 no. It doesn't work that way. No, no, no. That God is at work in this situation for the glory of God. So this man has been called an outcast. According to the Levitical law, because of his ailment, he, he would have been outcast. He couldn't go to the synagogue, couldn't go to the temple. Everybody would have thought this is either his fault or this is some sort, of, some sort of generational curse from his family. Can you imagine the kind of names this man has been called his entire life? And yet, when Jesus looked at this man, he goes, son. <laughs> you know why? Because this world does not get to tell you who you are. Only Jesus gets to tell you who you are. And we live in a world that tries to label you, man. And I'm here to tell you, according to Jesus, you are not your past and you're not your failures and you're not your illness and you're not your addiction and you're not your divorce or your abortion. You're not your sin. You're also not your success. You're not what your dad called you. You're not a failure. You're not a dummy. You're not what the world called you. Only Jesus gets to tell you who you are and his desire is to look at you tonight and call you son or daughter. And he looks at this man and he says, son, your sins are forgiven. Now imagine, if you're one of the friends, you're probably like, well, that's neat. That's not why we came. <laughs> I mean, we, we came so that you would fix his legs that we can see, not that you would fix his forgiveness, which we can't really see. But what Jesus is going to give us is not just, he's not gonna necessarily give us what we want, but he is there to meet all of our needs. And what all of us need is the forgiveness of our sin. And so he says, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts. You ought to pay attention to that. The Bible wants you to know that the scribes do not say this out loud with their mouth. And Jesus knows what they are thinking in their heart which means he knows what you're thinking in your heart right now. Like if you're thinking in your heart, yeah, right. He knows. He knows. You better sing Jesus Loves Me or something, all right? He knows. <laughs> and they're questioning in their heart, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? They're right. They are 100% right. God is the only one that can forgive sin. And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, 
Why do you question these things in your hearts? You see, here's the deal. Here's why it doesn't make sense to them. The only way Jesus would have authority to forgive the sins of these men is if he is the one that has been sinned against. And the Bible says that all sin is against God. I mean, all right, can you imagine? Can you imagine if you, you two right here, Rusty and Amy, okay, elder and elder's wife, okay? If you guys could just imagine, pretend, that one day on your way to church you got into a fight, okay? Just imagine. I know none of you ever have either, right? All right, so just... You just in the truck, come in here and be like, I've never, and you've always, and you know, and sometimes some people get, get in a fight and they get historical. You know what I'm talking about, historical? Like, you've been doing this since 1988. You're just like your drunk mama. You know, whatever you said, okay? So, it was a good one. And you fought all the way until you got to the door, and then you had to be like, put on elder face and be like, how y'all doing? Just blessed and highly favored and held hands all the way here. <clears throat> and even during the singing, but I can't believe you're gonna sing that, you hypocrite. The whole thing, right? So, <laughs> so I've heard. Okay, so. And imagine if right before I preached, I ran up to you and I said, hey, I know y'all been fighting. I forgive you. You'd be like, who do you think you are? Now I'm mad at you too. Why, you don't get to forgive. No, no, you, you can't forgive. You have nothing to do with this. And that would be true because I'm not in this fight. Jesus steps up right into the middle of any conflict, any fight, any sin ever, even if you didn't realize your sin was aimed at him, but all sin is a front against a holy and almighty God, and therefore he has the authority because of who he is, and he has the authority that he will earn through the cross and the empty tomb to look at this man and say, your sins are forgiven. That's what's going on here. Now, <clears throat> there was this there was this Jewish commentary that, that rabbis would like share. They would put it together. It's called the Talmud. And one of the things in the Talmud that would have been a really big deal in the first century is that they believed that God could not and would not bless a liar. And so Jesus goes on to say this in verse 9. So which is easier to say to a paralytic, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk? Okay, which is easier to say to the paralytic? Now, at first, you think, well, it's got to be easier to say your sins are forgiven. Why? Because you can't tell. How can you tell? There's not immediate evidence whether it worked or not. You're not going to actually know until you get to the great white throne judgment if it works. So it, it seems like it would be easier to say your sins are forgiven. Because it seems like it would be really hard if, I say, if you say stand up and walk. Because you're going to find out real quick, did it work or not? Stand up and walk. And then everybody can look over and see if it works or not. But in reality, what you got to think about is this. Is it really that hard if you are the creator of all things? And all things were made by you, for you, through you, and to you. And by your power, you hold all things together. If you are the creator and inventor of legs, is it that hard if you spoke everything to existence to just speak into existence right there for those legs that you control to work? That ain't even hard, man. Like the lights in heaven don't even dim down for a second at all. He says, so what's harder? It might be easy to say your sins are forgiven, but it wasn't easy to accomplish. Yeah, man. That God put on flesh and, and came and dwelt among us. And not only that, he was born humbly in a little manger in Bethlehem. And then he grew up. He grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. And all of his human life, never one time ever did he break a law of God. And he fulfilled the prophecy and every promise of God. And then was willing to go to the cross. To go to the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane and say, Father, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. Not my will, yet your will be done. Be beaten, be flogged until he was unrecognizable, and hang on a cross for the forgiveness of our sin. I mean, the first thing he says on the cross is, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, because he didn't want any of us to get confused as to why he came. And then, to be buried, I mean, door nailed dead, buried in a tomb. And then the Bible in Peter says some stuff that we can't even, we don't even know fully what it means, man. 
that he went into the darkness and put death to death, grabbed the keys to hell and Hades and death itself, and then defeated it, rolled the stone away, and walked out of the grave. That's what it took to forgive us of our sin. And so he says, which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed, and walk? Verse 10, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. In other words, what he's saying here is, I know, if I'm lying, then I can't heal this man. And all throughout this series, we're gonna see that when Jesus does a miracle, he's not just flexing his raw power, he's always pointing to God's redemptive purpose. And so he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. We're gonna spend a lot of time, a lot of time I think it's next week, on why he would tell him to pick up his mat. You would think he would say, just leave that mat right there, it's kinda gross. But I hope you know that oftentimes your greatest mess may be the platform for God's gospel message to the world, okay? And so he rose and immediately picked up his bed and he went out before them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God. That's what worship is. Saying, we never saw anything like this. Man, I was in a pastor's meeting all week in New York of all places. Oof, you wanna see lostness, go up there for a minute. I know you know that, you all moved down here, welcome, okay. <laughs> I never heard a person be like, you know what, when I get done working, I'm gonna move up north. Never heard it in my life, y'all come to us, all right. I'm with 10 other pastors, and, and every time I shared what God is doing in us and among us, I mean, to the pastor, they basically say, we never saw anything like this. Man, me either, me either. I mean, God is doing some unbelievable things in us, through us, and to us, amen? Now, here's the thing. He didn't start this movement for it to stop with us. Again, remember, the people on the inside of the house who already had a seat were the most comfortable, and they felt pretty good because they had a front row to the Bible study. They're taking all the notes. And yet, Jesus rewards the fact that the people that already have a seat are the ones that all the debris falls on, and they are the most discomforted ones so that somebody else could come and meet him. So let me ask you this. What would it look like for you to be the kind of friend that this paralyzed guy had? What would it look like for us to be the kind of church that was full of people like this that were willing to do whatever it takes to get our friends to Jesus? He had four friends, four corners of the mat. What if there are four corners of this mat that you and I are responsible for to pick up so that we can bring one more person to Jesus? Here are the four things that I see that have to happen. Number one is you gotta share your faith. You have to share your faith. Acts 1.8 says this. These are the words of Jesus. Jesus says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, does it say the preacher will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes to the preacher and the preacher will be a witness? No, no, no. It says you. That's right. Do you realize the same Spirit of God that resurrected from Jesus is on the inside of every single believer and there is power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And the primary evidence of the power of the Spirit of God is that you will share your faith whenever he prompts you to do it. Wherever you go, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Jerusalem is like where you live. Uh, Judea is like wherever you're going. Samaria is even the people you don't like that good. And ends of the earth. Share your faith. Now, here's what this means. I know sometimes when you hear the phrase, share your faith, you think, because the last time somebody shared their faith with you was a bullhorn on the way to the Jags game. They're like, you're going to hell. I'm like, could you relax, okay? So, and if you had the going to hell, yell at people ministry, let's talk about that sometime <laughs> offline, all right? But sometimes God gives you the opportunity to share the gospel with somebody. Have you identified your one more? Is there one person that you believe God has placed in your life that God might use you to share your faith with that person. And sometimes it's the whole kit and caboodle, man. You're, you're your own little Billy Graham. You do the whole thing. You diagnose them, say, hey, you're a sinner in need of a savior. Can I tell you about Jesus? And you share the gospel and, and you do the whole deal. Sometimes it's just you share your story. The people are like, well, how'd you get into this? And you just share your story. Like in John chapter nine, there was a man born blind and the religious leaders keep asking him, what happened to you? And he goes, all right, here's what happened. 
I used to be blind, I met Jesus, now I see. They ask him a series of about four or five questions every time he goes, I have no idea what you're talking about, but let me tell you what I do now. I used to be blind, I met Jesus, now I see. Maybe you share your story. Sometimes you share an invitation. You share an invitation. And there's a difference between an invite and a non-vite. A non-vite is you should come to my church with me sometime. There's no sometime on your calendar. An invitation is next Thursday night, we're gonna show up to Dick's Wings at six, we're going, I'm gonna buy you some wings, and then we're gonna go to 722 together. That's an invitation. And let me just give you an easy one, okay? Everybody in the country is moving to Florida right now, okay? So the next time some Yankees move into your neighborhood, <laughs> hey man, and if you're a Yankee, we love you. We're a movement for all people, okay? We built this place for you, we're so glad you're here. Now if you're trying to turn here or there, I'll cast you out like a demon, but that's a different sermon, okay? So. <laughs> We love you, man. We're glad you're here. You're smart. You're the smart one. That's why you moved here with us, all right, where Jesus lives. Now, when a Yankee moves into your neighborhood, your first question is, so where do you go to church? And regardless of the answer, they're like, well, regardless of what you believe, you got to have a church. You got to come to mind with me so you can at least claim a church, right? And you never know what's going to happen. Another one. Let me just give you, this is so easy. I dare you at work tomorrow, just, or Monday, ask this person this. Go, hey, what'd you do this weekend? And you know what they're going to do? They're going to say some junk, and then they're going to ask you, what did you do this weekend? Do you know how easy it is to be like, I went to church. Would you like to come with me next Sunday? Share an invitation. Sometimes you just share a burden. You just share, you just share the fact that you're a praying person, and you ask, how can I be praying for you? Because what will happen is, when, they, when the wheels start falling off their life, and at some point they will, guess who they're going to come running to, regardless of what they believe? They're going to come running to the person that said they would pray for them. And sometimes you just share one more cup of coffee. Because these are people that we love, not projects. We're not trying to accomplish a thing. You just build that relationship. We have classes around here. You can go to coe22.com slash classes, and there's a, there's a class called Share Your Faith Workshop. You should go to that. Number two, so... One corner, share your faith. Another corner is you gotta serve at your local church. Serve at your campus. You gotta move beyond just being a consumer to a contributor. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12 say it this way. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. Those are like the offices in the church. In our current context, that would be like the staff. To equip the saints for the work of ministry for the building up of the body of Christ. Now, pop quiz. Do you know who the saints are? You. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, according to the Bible, you're a saint. Do you hear that, Catholics? Y'all should be so pumped. You can get a necklace with your own name on it now. Look at there, Saint Ted. Call your mama. Hey, pastor said I'm a saint. Ah, you're actually a priest too. Woo, it's going crazy. All right, I don't have time to explain that one even yet, but that's it. That according to the Bible, I'm not actually in the ministry. I'm not. My job is to equip you, the saints, for the work of the ministry. Do you realize all that has to happen when people show up here to meet Jesus? Before I ever get to the part where I share the gospel with people, do you understand that we gotta have saints in the facilities to get this place right and saints in the parking lot? Good Lord, we need saints in the parking lot because we all drive like the devil. And we need saints greeting and saints setting up all the chairs and saints checking in your kids. Yeah, man. A part of the way that it's made possible that people can come here and meet Jesus is because the saints are working, doing the works of the ministry for the building up of the body of Christ. If you're not serving, you need to serve. Text the word serve to 441122. The third corner is we gotta consistently remove obstacles. As a church, we've gotta consistently remove obstacles. In Acts 15, <clears throat> the gospel begins to go to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles receive Jesus and get filled with the Holy Spirit. And then the church people that are back in Jerusalem have to have a business meeting. It's the first business meeting in the church and the Bible. And here's what church business meetings usually do. They usually get together to vote on, can God do what he's already done? That's usually what they do. And the key question is, do you have to follow all the traditions before you become a believer? Really what they were asking is, do you have to be Jewish before you can trust Jesus? And the primary thing they were asking is, do you have to get circumcised to be a Jesus follower? Right. I know some of you think it's difficult to be a covenant member here at our church because we ask you to go to a meeting. We don't ask you to make a 
appointment with a surgeon, okay? So you're welcome. <laughs> James stands up and is like, no, no, no. He asks a simple question. Why would we make it difficult for those who are turning to the Lord? You ever been to a church that made it difficult for those who are turning to the Lord? I mean, I was deeply scarred when I was in seminary because I was working at this little fundamentalist church in South Carolina, and I was working at this gym, and I was like the smoothie guy, and I was also a youth pastor about 45 minutes inland, this little, little church, little real country church with dress codes and all the things. And there was a bunch of dancers, not like ballerinas, a bunch of strippers that went to our gym. And I would sit at the desk, and I would write my youth sermons. And before long, they would all come sit around and drink their drinks and and I thought, well, you know what? I'll just preach my sermons to the strippers. I feel like if I can connect with them, maybe it'll help me connect with my students. All right, here we go. <laughs> They'd ask questions, we'd get to talking. And then what began to happen in a very short amount of time is those girls went from those girls to, I like I knew their names. And they all had two names. <laughs> they did. And they had kids, they all had kids. They were all ashamed to let their kids know what they were doing. And none of them, none of them had this as a plan. None of them. And they all thought, said, I'm just, I'm just going to do it for a minute, man. I'm just going to do it for a minute. But then the money was good, and then they spent all the money, so they required more money, and they felt like they were trapped. And I, and I would ask, I mean, for weeks, I'd be like, hey, y'all want to go to church? Anybody want to go to church with me? And then one time, this girl, her name was Sunshine, and she said, I'll go to church with you. And I remember thinking, Oh, crap. <laughs> we don't, this is, it was, it was a very tight dress code. And she was like, okay, I'll pick you up. And so she pulled up in her, in her convertible Corvette. And the license plate said topless fun for like a little double entendre there, right? <laughs> I was like, this is going to go awesome. And so we went to church, man. So we dropped her kid off at Sunday school. And I'm telling you, we walk, when we're walking in, um, this is one of the churches. You ever been to one where they have the thrones up front? You know what I'm talking about? It's like senior pastor gets a big throne, then the worship guy gets the next big throne. I had the wee little bitty throne way over there because I was like the summer youth guy. And they would only let me do the announcements. And, <clears throat> and when she showed up, I mean, she may have had her on her Sunday best, but she was heavily invested in her career. It was just, it was just obvious. And afterwards, a deacon came up to me and said, we need to meet with you. Now, deacon in that church meant power broker. In our church in the Bible, deacon means servant. And so we had a meeting, man, and I got in trouble. And the man said, why'd you bring somebody like that here? He said, this church is to keep our children safe from people like that. And I went down. I was afraid to lose my job. I was afraid to get back to my school. I don't know. I was just afraid, man. So I just tucked my head and left. When I got out, she's leaning on the car. Her kid is sitting in the seat coloring a picture of Jesus from Sunday school. She's crying like crazy through, under her Ray-Bans. She goes, that meeting was about me, right? And I lied. No. Nah. We get in the car, we're driving back. I don't know what to say. It's this awkward silence. So I said, so what'd you think? <clears throat> she said, I've never felt more devalued in my whole life. Two nights before, she's dancing naked on a pole for a dollar at a time in front of dudes she's never met before. And yet she walked into a place that's supposed to be the banner of the love of Jesus for all people, and she met, felt more devalued in that place than anywhere she'd ever been. I made a promise that day that if I ever had anything to do with the leadership of any church, that we would have the kind of church that Sunshine could show up and meet Jesus, be run over by the grace train of Jesus, and that we would be there to help her, not condemn her. <clears throat> That's the kind of church we have to be. One of the corners is we have to consistently tear down any obstacles that are in the way. Some of those are physical and financial some of those are distant. Some of you crazy people drive like an hour to come to church, man. We need to put a campus where you live so you can bring your neighbors to church. You understand this? Some, you know, as soon, if the place gets full, we, we need more. 
We, we got to have seats. We got to have places for people to come meet Jesus. And then, the fourth one is the most important. The first one, share your faith. The second one is serve in the local church. The third one is remove every obstacle. But if the fourth one don't happen, nothing ain't happening. That only God can change a life. I don't care how good the music is and how sweet the buildings are and how wonderful your gospel presentation is and how cool our children's ministry is. If Jesus does not reach into a human's chest and rip out that heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh, his heart ain't nothing changing. But it is our job to do whatever it takes to get people into that place where they can meet Jesus. I mean, listen to this invitation. Here's what Jesus, if you're, if you're not a believer, I don't, I, I'm sure you've got all kind of ideas about who Jesus is, all right? Here's what he says. This is out of John 15. <clears throat> Jesus says, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Then he says, you are my friends. If you do what I command you, no longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends for all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. Jesus is the only person that ever claimed any kind of divinity. And what he offered was not a set of rules. What he'd offered was himself as a friend. That's what he wants to offer to you right now. And church, that's what we have to be about 100%, whatever it takes to get people into the presence of Jesus so that they, by the power of the Holy Spirit, can hear the invitation of Jesus saying, I want to look at you and say, son, daughter, your sins are forgiven, and become a friend of Jesus. I started with a story about my boy, I'm gonna end with a story about my, my boy. Now he's 17, junior in high school. This happened about three weeks ago. <clears throat> It's like 7.45 in the morning, he's on his way to school. He takes his little sister, Reagan Capri, she's 13. He's got a little car, they're on their way. He gets to the stoplight and he's like in the pole position where he's gonna turn left. The school's only about a mile down that road. And um, they're just sitting there doing whatever they do, you know. It's probably not sharing prayer requests and listening to worship music, you know, whatever they're doing. <clears throat> and then out of nowhere, uh, a car must have run a stoplight and a truck T-bones this car, a little like four-door sedan type car, flips it over on its side, and JP says the car just goes, just sliding down the road like 20, 30 yards. And so his instinct puts it in park, says, Reagan, you stay right here. And he gets out and he runs across the road and he gets to the car and when he gets there, it's four nurses on the way to Mayo. And he says there's blood and they're screaming and it smells all terrible. <clears throat> the airbags are out. The, the, the two in the front are able to get out, but the two in the back can't. And so he and one grown man try to open the door, and they can't get the door open, you know, because it's on its top. It's kind of crunched a little bit, and he's a relatively strong dude. And so they get it together, and after about three or four, they just do what it takes, and they, they, they get it open enough. Then he gets down on his knees and there's this nurse hanging upside down, huge gash in her head. Her leg, he said her leg was in really rough shape. And look, man, typically, that's, he's not into that stuff. And she's screaming, she's crying, she's in pain, and her seatbelt's stuck, so eventually he gets her seatbelt undone, she comes crashing down, he puts his arms in her armpits and begins to drag her out like this, and he says, she, she looks up to him, I mean, just blood, and she's just like, thank you, thank you, thank you. And then as he's telling me the story, his tone of voice just began to change. And he's got a little bit of me in him. Sometimes, sometimes when I get emotional, it's not because I'm sad. I get a little like, there's a verse in it. In John chapter 11, when the Bible says that Jesus groaned because of Lazarus, it means like to snort like a bull. Because you're, you're, there's like anger and a little bit of confusion. Jesus wasn't confused. But you know, you ever get that way, man? And so he starts looking at me and I'm like, what's wrong? He said, Daddy, I'm pulling this lady out. And it's me and one grown man, a, a, a grown man and a junior in high school. And he said, when I looked around, there's adults all over the place. And I said, I said, well, what are they doing? And he said, every single one of them just had their phone out like this, just videoing it for YouTube. And then he said, he said, Daddy, they were a bunch of, and he, I could tell he's trying to choose his words. 
And I was like, just say it. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> and I will not repeat it here, okay? It was the Greek for wimp, you understand? With an adjective. But he's all choked up and he's like, Daddy? Did I look around? He said it again. He said, I'm a junior in high school, man. I'm, a, I'm like a kid. And there's this one guy, and then everybody else is just with their phone, and they were a bunch of wimps. I was like, that's exactly what they are, dude. That's exactly what they are. Like when somebody needed them most, they're just, they're just a bunch of wimps. And in that moment, dude, you played the man. Way to go. And then later that night, I, I got home, and I said, Reagan, what happened today? <laughs> Reagan, my 13-year-old, daughter is not necessarily in the habit of giving, giving superlatives to her 17-year-old older brother. You understand? Anybody ever been there? And immediately when I asked, she said, Daddy, JP's a hero. Church of 1122, we will be the kind of church that when the car wreck happens... When people are hurting, when people are bleeding, when people are in need, when the world has told them they, they are invalid, not to us, man. Whatever it costs, we'll run through the traffic, we'll put ourselves at risk. If the whole rest of the world just wants to watch, I don't know, man, I can't change the rest of the world, but I can tell you what I'm gonna do is that when, we, when there are people in need, when we find ourselves in a desperate situation, that we will be the kind of church that does whatever it takes to run to those who are hurting and run to the lost. We'll tear the roof off, whatever it costs. Why? Why? Because we're the one in the car. Don't you know that? We're the one in the car, and we're not the heroes. Jesus is the hero. When, when we ran the red light and we got T-boned and we find ourselves stuck in our own sin and shame and we're thinking, I wish somebody would come and save me, then Jesus at great expense to himself, he ran out of heaven, he put flesh on, he went all the way to the cross and he did everything that was needed so that we could be forgiven. Hey, if you've never put your faith in Jesus, Will you just play a game with me for a second? Can you imagine if you were the paralytic on the mat? Can you imagine? Because by the way, if somebody invited you here tonight, it's because they love you. They may have never told you that. Maybe you're like, you know, gym partners, and that would get awkward, but that's what's going on, man. If they invited you here tonight, it's because they love you and they've been praying for you. And they might not have had the best words to say it. They don't even know how to describe it all the way. But here's what they knew. They knew if that you could get in here, that you could be in the presence of Jesus. And imagine, imagine, man, imagine. You're on that mat 2,000 years ago, and you got some people that love you enough that say, trust us, man. We're going to take you to a place that can make a difference. And they tear a hole in. Can you imagine if you were being lowered down in that moment 2,000 years ago? And you locked eyeballs with Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, son, your sins are forgiven. And for whatever reason, in that moment you said, I believe, I believe. Well, I got really good news, man. We serve a living savior. We just celebrated a couple, couple of weeks ago. He came out of the grave. He's alive today. He's sitting at the right hand of his heavenly father. And he is praying on your behalf. And in this moment, right now, just as real as that encounter with Jesus, with Jesus was 2,000 years ago, you can have the same kind of encounter and your sins can be forgiven and you can be a son or a daughter of the Most High King. Not because of anything that you have done, but because of what Christ did for you on that cross. And you say, what do I do? You believe. That's it, man. That's it, that you just trust that he calls you son and daughter, and that by his stripes on the cross, you are healed. Because he was pierced, our transgressions are forgiven. When he says it is finished on the cross, that counted for you. And in this moment right now, your sins are forgiven, and you could be a son or a daughter of the king, adopted into his family forever and ever and ever. Would you bow your head? Would you close your eyes? And if you would say, that's what I want. 
I don't need to explain it anymore. That's what I want. In this moment right now, I want to put my faith in Jesus, have my sins forgiven, and be a son or a daughter of the king. If that's you, for the very first time, would you lift your hand as high as you can and say, Father, here I am. Say, Father, here I am. I surrender. Praise God. Our good and gracious heavenly Father, God, we love you more than anything because you first loved us. And God, I thank you and I praise you when we were beaten up, battered, and bruised. You did not send suggestions on how we could improve our situation. You sent a savior to save us from our sins. God, I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit, under the authority of the word of God, with the love of the heavenly Father and the invitation of Jesus Christ to be our friend, may this church always and forever be the kind of place that is willing to do whatever it takes to be a part of why you came to seek and to save the lost. God, we love you, and we thank you that the second greatest miracle of all time has already happened in this room tonight, that there's some lost people that are found. There's some dead people who have been made alive. And so, God, may we be like the people that witnessed the paralyzed man being healed. May we glorify you and say, we've never seen anything like this. And we pray this in the only name that matters when you pray. We pray this in the good, strong name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Church, would you stand to your feet? <clears throat> we are going to sing. We're going to do exactly what they did in Mark chapter 2. We're going to glorify God. We're going to sing. We're going to sing to the way maker who makes a way where there seems to be no way. We're going to bring our tithes and offering. And I just need you to know this. Every single time you do that, a part of what God does is God takes the little bit that we bring and he multiplies it. He does things with it that we could never do. And God uses that to reach people that are far from him. And we're gonna pray. You're desperate, you have a need, or you got a friend, maybe they're not even here, but you know they're laying on a mat somewhere, then won't you come and bring it to the Father? Let's sing, let's bring, let's pray. Let's respond.